Have you seen me dice bag? <laughs> Hello, I'm Dirt the Dice, and this is the Grognard Files podcast, talking bobbins about tabletop RPG from back in the day. This is a micro grog pod with extra bits that didn't quite fit into the second episode, which was all about Call of Cthulhu. It's one of those supplements that you look at and think, I'm sure I've already got this, but you buy it anyway. And when you get it home, you say, I have got it. They've changed the bloody cover. This micro grog pod contains sections that fell out of the bulging episode, including the Games Master screen, or in this case, the Keeper screen, where I'll roll on a table containing some of the published highlights of Call of Cthulhu from back in the day and select five for discussion. And Judge Blythe, the resident rules lawyer, will be joining me. In the next section, I'll then take this list of supplements to the end of our garden, push past the deadly nightshade and the aldromai to Ed's bargain shed, and discover how to get hold of the supplements from Eddie, the armchair adventurer's very own David Dickinson. For our overseas listeners, David Dickinson is a daytime TV antiques expert that's been dipped in oak varnish. Eddie hasn't been dipped in varnish. If anything, he's been left unfinished. Finally, I'll be emptying my sack of posts and reading some listener contributions. The contributions, suggestions and friendly feedback have been great so far and very encouraging, so thanks for that. Television's Michael Cool of Rumble at the Tin Inn fame and host of Improvised Radio Theatre with Dice podcast has provided some additionally rata and nuggets missed from the potted history of RuneQuest, which was the micro grog supplement to the first episode. He says, On RuneQuest, in the chaos that was Greg extracting his world from the system from Avalon Hill, there were two projects that never properly got published. One was RuneQuest Adventures in Glorantha, originally called RuneQuest 4, which numbering caused confusion later. This was Avalon Hill trying to revitalise the property. It had some good points, but it went in the direction that Greg was tired of. Even more simulation, even heavier rules. So, somehow, Greg ended up with the rights to the system, but Avalon Hill ended up with the rights for the name. RuneQuest and tried to use it by commissioning RuneQuest Slayers, an abomination against the muse of RPGs that could only be explained by Avron Hill assuming that gamers are deeply, deeply stupid and will buy things on name recognition alone. So Greg went off to Robin Laws and got Hero Wars stroke Hero Quest started and had to wait several years for the name to return to him so he could let Mongoose have a go. And then there's the fact that when Mongoose stopped doing the RuneQuest, the system, Mongoose RuneQuest 2, it led to two successor systems, not just the one that you implied, RuneQuest 6 and Legend. Michael's right, I did choose to skate over the Mongoose years, I do recommend his podcast, uh, Improvised Radio Theatre with Dice, that he delivers with his friend, Roger Bell West. I've described it as Ken and Robin talk about stuff if it was done by Newman and Badil, which they've taken in good spirits. That's you, that is. They have engaging lines of argument and a great deal of gaming wisdom delivered in a gentle good humour. Later in this episode's postbag, in the final section of this micro grog pod, there's been an intriguing lead submitted, revealing the inspiration behind Sandy Peterson's sanity mechanics. But for now, ramblers, let's get rambling. Games Master Screen! Hello, I've got Blythe with me. He's a simple Blythe. I've stripped you of your title for this uh, segment. 
Exactly. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. The wig's off, and I'm no longer sitting in court. Because we're not talking about rules here. We're talking about supplements. Now I'm going to just um, delve in my bag, and I'm going to erect this temporary structure in front of us. Okay. Don't worry. I don't think we need planning permission. So put that between us, because I am the keeper of arcane lore, and behind the screen, I can't let you see what's behind the no, screen, no, because no. I've got a table that is full of Call of Cthulhu supplements. Okay. And you're going to select five. All right. By using this, the cursed dice cup. The cursed dice cup that your mother got you for Christmas, was it this last Christmas? Yes, it was. Yeah. Your mother's never liked role-playing games, <laughs> and I consider this an attempt to dissuade you from playing them because this is this cup has delivered some of those terrible roles in all our role-playing careers hasn't it <laughs> i don't i don't think it's cursed though I, I do insist that it's just random but i i don't think dice are random i think they're cursed or they're not cursed i have favorite dice i have dice i don't like yeah oh and i have with respect i'm a rational man but when it comes to dice rationality goes out the window well Hopefully, some of the curse will transfer to you and, and off me. <laughs> what we're going to do is, uh, as I say, I want you to roll the roll the dice, and then I'll consult this table behind my screen, okay. and then we'll discuss it. Okay, give it a good shake. Okay, I'll give it a shake. Okay, you've got a seventy three. Okay, and that's the nineteen nineties handbook. Oh, okay. Okay. A bit of Cthulhu now. I think we uh, followed that uh, particular field. Mm. Of area when we uh, did the last episode, and in many ways this uh, handbook's unnecessary because I don't really need a primer on uh, pornography and drugs. You know, I'm a man of the world, <laughs> but th- th- it does actually provide provide that. And the other thing that it does is gives a it gives a list of equipment, and in many uh, places it's a bit like uh, an episode of Guns and Ammo. You know, mm. like cool, look at the recoil on that. You know. That's, and I don't know why supplements feel the need for that, you know, feel the need to give you a list and list of stuff. Yeah, it, it, I think the, the 1990s supplement was a strange thing because it, it was the 1990s, wasn't it? And we kind of lived through it. It's not too historical. It's not like the 1890s where you might need a little bit of guidance. But it, it, all this equipment list takes up a, a sizable chunk of it. But what's good about it, I think, is it's got um, details of various American and international agencies and how they enforce law or chaos, depending upon who they are. And it's also got um, details of organised crime gangs, such as the Yakuza, which is all inspiring stuff and grist for the mill for a keeper who you want, who wants to use a modern age setting. But I think where, where it really uh, comes into its own is the scenario hooks that are in the back. I've not used any of them directly, but... It's given me little twists of um, uh, details that give a, a, a seed for a story. Uh, there's a good one uh, where it talks about the Church of the Glorious Return, which is like a, a well-meaning evangelical group who, who don't realise that they stumbled on something horrific. And there's a, a lot of the pre-millennium stuff in there. Remember the uh, Millennium Bug? I do, yeah, I do remember the Millennium Bug, yeah, yeah. I think you were actively involved in uh, I was, saving I the was world from the millennium. I, at a local authority that I once worked at, I was asleep through several okay. meetings that discussed the end of the world uh, because of the millennium bug. Apparently toasters would fail, microwaves wouldn't work, kettles wouldn't boil, uh, and Armageddon was looming. Yeah, and imagine if uh, Cthulhu was behind all that. You know, yeah, it, Cthulhu stops us having toast and tea. It, it truly is a monster. It brings a whole new meaning to uh, the book in a millennium book, doesn't it? Mm. <laughs> well, I think, I, I mean, to pick up your point about the 1990s, I mean, reading it now, um, looking through it, it's it's quite quaint, um, you know, because it, mm. it, uh, it mentions mainframe computers. Um, yeah, yeah. I suppose the other thing it, it does, which is, is a more general thing, is uh, at the time it put the idea there of setting a role-playing game now. Um, I mean, we, we had played games that were set now. I think we played Top Secret a few times, which is a, a TSR, Secret Service, role-playing game, which was set uh, in the modern era. But generally speaking, for us anyway, our experience of a fantasy game, um, which, which is what Call of Cthulhu is, you know, yeah, there's yeah. elements of fantasy and science fiction in it, 
as well as horror. They were always set either in the past or in some other world. The idea of Cthulhu now was an interesting one, and it was quite a radical idea that you could set this stuff now, yeah, at, at yeah. the present moment, which perhaps now seems not such a big idea. But again, if you go back to the time, I think it was quite a radical idea. Yeah. The, the, the first time I think I heard of Cthulhu now was uh, in the White Dwarf article by Marcus L. Rowland. Uh, I remember it well because it had uh, a job seeker looking for uh, a job with a Mohican and a tentacle wrapping around his legs. I don't even remember <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, I think it's a, a good supplement, a bit dated, but uh, it, it's useful to have in the collection. Give the give the curse cup another share. Okay, I will. Okay, twenty six. 26. The numbers are relevant, right? But 26! 26. Like bingo. 26, 26. Yeah. White dwarf scenarios. So in the, in the main episode, at Daily Dwarf made a contribution choosing ghosts, its ghoulies and squid for his selection of the Cthulhu feature. However, White Dwarf was really important, wasn't it, uh, in helping us get to grips with the potential of the game. I had the first campaign, which was Shadows of yogg Sothoth. But it, it seemed overwhelming because it was painted on a huge canvas. And I think what White Dwarf did, it kind of made it a bit smaller, brought it down to size. Yeah, I think it did. It, it gave you um, manageable one-up scenarios, uh, which were often quite inventive, um, and gave you different insights into the game. Whereas, you're right, the, the bigger campaigns, uh, there was that, always that sense of they were kind of sprawling, epic campaigns. Uh, and, and to be fair, even now, even though we've been role-playing for, what, 30 years on and off, uh, I think running big campaigns, particularly Cthulhu campaigns, it is quite challenging. Uh, you know, yeah. Mass and Athletep uh, is a challenging scenario, challenging campaign to play in and to run. Uh, and I think you're right, the White Dwarf scenarios were, were good inroads into, which at the time it was quite a different game, it was a bit different, but more tricky to get your head around because it had elements of investigation and what have you. And I think the scenarios in White Dwarf were a good way into that. And certainly I remember you when you were running those games, that, that's the way you felt and that's the way it came across. Yeah, what, what they tended to do is um, bring it right in so they'd have a, a village under peril. So Watchers of Walbersbrook, which I think is the first scenario that was in White Dwarf or Cthulhu. Uh, and that came out before... The Games Workshop actually did their edition. But yeah, the Surrey Enigma is another one. Where it's just like a, a, a small area that's, uh, that's under threat. Strange things are going on and uh, it's under threat. But I want to give a, a mention as well to um, Horse of the Invisible. I don't particularly like the haunted houses scenarios. But that one's particularly good because it takes over a, a place over a period of time and it really builds on that things that go bump in the night. What we should what we should mention is at Daily Dwarf has just had a scenario slam where he's invited people to vote for their favourite scenario from White Dwarf, and the winner was Curse of the Bone, which is one that was is pretty close to our hearts. It is, yeah, yeah. We played Curse of the Bone, um, and again, I think you said it was probably the scenario in which you and me were both kind of got to Cthulhu and understood what it what it was all about, really. Yeah, and it, and even though it was quite late on, so we've been playing Cthulhu for mm. uh, a while, it was that one that really got us hooked, didn't it? Really yeah. got us engaged yeah. in it. Um, yeah. And it's a fairly simple idea. You, uh, you find a load of red herrings that send you hither and thither around the, uh, the country, and little realising that the uh, horror is on your doorstep. And um, there's a great character in there who's suffering from post-traumatic stress and uh, shades of cannibalism in there and uh, underground warrens filled with ghouls. So it's, it's a really good thing. And I, I've used it several times since. Not entirely successfully. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I honestly played this, played this at college with a group of people who played Warhammer and uh, D&D. And they did it. And the, the police turned up and... They honestly killed the police and ransacked the pockets. They mi- <laughs> they, they misunderstood the Cthulhu completely, but a great scenario and a worthy winner. 
of the scenario slam. Okay, let's give the uh, dice another shake. 62. 62. Who would have thought 62 would turn up in this? Yeah. The dice cup's not as bad as I thought. It's working. Have you, have you seen this one before? This is Green and Pleasant Land. Do you yeah. remember this one? I do remember it, yeah. So this is the British 1920s and 1930s Cthulhu source pack. And it was published in uh, 19... 19- 87 by Games Workshop and the production schedule for that year must have been incredible because when you look at some of their great uh, rules that they produced and great supplements, they all came from that period, it was at the height of the pump in terms of uh, role playing supplements of course they kind of died off after that and concentrated on producing Warhammer but uh, there's a, a really big peak at this point. And I like uh, Cthulhu games to be parochial. And there's something about creating the immediacy of having scenarios that are closer to home. And the thought that the deep ones might be lurking in your garden pond, is the, that, that creates the horror, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's right. It was It was an interesting supplement because setting things in this country, the country where you lived, it did, did li- literally and metaphorically bring it closer to home. Um, whereas the other games of Cthulhu were always set in America and, you know, it seemed a little bit exotic. But uh, the fact you could set a, uh, a Cthulhu game in Manchester, in, you know, in the past, albeit in the past, but in Manchester, in Liverpool, in, in places that you knew, you know, yeah. were, was an interesting idea. Uh, and again, I suppose, it, again, it, I think it's fair to say it was quite a radical idea because again role playing games tended to be set from from a British perspective they always tended to be set somewhere else I mean even if it wasn't a fantasy world or a science fiction universe it was another country yeah you know so there was always that sense it was it was all for British role players role playing games were always somewhere else yeah that's that's the feeling you got uh, and there might be one or two exceptions, but that was the, the mainstream role playing games were always set somewhere else. Green and Pleasant Land brought it home, and yeah. that felt quite exciting. I think. Yeah, and I think it would it uses the format of the nineteen twenties source book that you got with the rules, uh, so it, it it essentially follows the same same pattern, same same kind of look and feel. But the illustrations are fantastic. I mean, just look at the cover. You've got, uh, it's by Lee Gibbons, a cricket on the green mm. with a, a tentacle emerging from the undergrowth. And H.P. Lovecraft was actually English by descent and uh, very proud of his heritage. And he would affect the air an English gent. And he suggested that Dunwich, uh, the story set in Maine, was actually based on the Suffolk um, town. Uh, in England there's a short story in here as well by uh, Brian Lumley who has used the uh, uh, British setting to set Cthulhu short stories in um, so it, it gives it a real uh, dark darkness feel of it in here as well there's also the uh, biographies of uh, famous and important people in, in, in Britain and England at the time and the, it, what's interesting you've got Agatha Christie but you've also got her fictional creations alongside each other <laughs> to, to, to use as characters in there. But I think some of the uh, actual uh, living characters as well are, are fascinating. So you've got Eamon de Valera, who is a fascinating character, He's an American-born uh, Irish Republican leader who became the first president of uh, the Free State of Ireland. But he was beset by compromise and recriminations. And alongside that, you've got the 14 uh, Disasters uh, timeline as well so you've got so in 19, uh, 1923 there was a witch that died in an exorcism uh, and there's a scenario hook there isn't there? yeah you know yeah. just just peppering the yeah. supplement with stuff like that really really and i think yeah. as well it is it is more accessible uh in a sense to a british player because um whilst you do have a sense of america in the 1920s through films and what have you you, you have a a greater sense of Britain or the UK in the 1920s because you're closer to it. You know, you've done some of the history at school. You have a sense, as you just said, about Irish republicanism yeah. in the in the kind of turn of the century. You have a sense of what that is 
Yes. Um, and you can exploit that and use that uh, in a game perhaps more readily than certain elements of American history that whilst you have an awareness of, you're not, you're not quite as familiar with. Uh, and that, that's important in Cthulhu, I think, because uh, it's quite an open game. So it, it's an investigative, investigative game where players can do and go anywhere. So having a sense of what the world's like at the time yeah. is quite important for the keeper and for the players. Yeah. Uh, and if it's set on kind of your home turf <laughs> and you have a bit of knowledge there anyway, it makes it slightly easier and perhaps a bit richer in some senses. Yeah, and I, and I just like, as I, as I said previously in the previous episode, I really like the idea of using these real-world elements. So, you know, what what mm. caused the uh, Valera to uh, compromise? What what were the forces, agencies that yeah. were yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. working, uh, working at? So really, really good stuff. I think as well there's like an eccentricity to this supplement. Um, it's which we were familiar with from uh, White Dwarf because many of the writers that contributed to this were uh, contributed to White Dwarf. And there's a particular good uh, chapter on uh, on follies, so follies, uh, point, uh, pointless uh, architectural features uh, built in the middle of the uh, countryside by aristocrats and uh, wealthy landowners uh, as a kind of pompous statement of the place in society and i think it brings it home to me because i live in the shadow of one of lord lethum's you do yeah. follies and uh it does intrigue me to think that you know maybe the things that were built around riddington were actually hiding some sinister dark secret uh, and in the chinese gardens of the lord liverpool's castle there were just like ornamental features in a in a garden maybe they're hiding some deep ones let's so, hope so yeah. Okay, let's roll again. It's a four. It's a four, which means on this table it's a critical, critical. hit. A critical hit. So masks of Neaflata. And before we go on, I think we need to talk about pronunciation here. <laughs> because we've had it, I've, I've already had it picked up that uh, Dagon, Dagon, you say Dagon, I say Dagon. And Neaflata. Uh, I think we actually diminish the status of the Dark Lord by speaking it in a, in a Bolton accent. Yeah, and possibly mispronouncing it. Yeah. So I, I call him Yathletep. Bugger off, you know. Yeah, Yathletep. It's our game. Yeah. Not, not your game anymore, HP Lovecraft. It's ours. Yes. We call him Yathletep. <laughs> Yathletep. Yes, yeah. Whatever. Whatever. What he's safer. To, spell, to speak his name properly probably yeah. invokes him, doesn't it? So we're, we're just playing safe by mispronouncing everything in Cthulhu. So if Borderlands was the gold standard in campaign packs, RuneQuest, then Master Yathletep is platinum. And uh, some say it's the greatest adventure ever written. But I, I'd argue that it it, it, it's so important. It's so important in the history of Call of Cthulhu that it's probably responsible for its longevity. The reason why Call of Cthulhu has lasted so long because it, it demonstrated the richness of the setting and the potential of the game like nothing else. Um, and we'll try and discuss it without too many spoilers. But the investigators are drawn together thanks to a friend who. Uh, after a spectacular and thrilling opening sequence, they plunged into a plot where several years earlier, a society gent by the name of Carlisle was seduced into gathering an expedition to Africa where he and his party were apparently brutally murdered. Uh, the box set came with lavish handouts that gave clues to the world-spanning adventure, and the investigators followed a trail of Carlisle expedition to London, Kenya, Egypt and Shanghai, and in some editions, uh, in Australia. So to try and uncover the mystery, uh, breaking into places, um, witnessing bizarre rituals, and it, it concludes with a great spectacular finale worthy of James Bond. So we played it, we, we got together, didn't we, in uh, yeah. 2010, after years of not playing together, and we played this campaign over about three years, didn't we? So what were your experiences as a player? Um, well, as a player, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I think it's, but I do think it's a very challenging campaign. Um, yeah. In that it, it's, I suppose it's what people would now call 
uh, sandbox campaign in that you can, as a player, within reason, go anywhere and do anything. And so it's quite tricky because there are different locations, different bits of the world you have to visit, uh, but you can do those in any order. And if you do them in a particular order, then you'll get clues in a particular order and you'll draw particular conclusions, um, which is tricky for players because it becomes quite complicated. And it's tricky for the keeper or games master because, as I was sort of alluding to earlier, you've got to kind of keep lots of plates spinning as you run. So it's quite a challenging scenario. Yeah, it's campaign. It is, it is complicated, but it's not too baffling, is it? The- no, it's not too baffling. And, and I think in, in some senses what I enjoyed about it, this may put me a bad lie, I know I, know I said in the previous podcast that I wanted to be Indiana Jones. It does allow you a little bit of that yeah. kind of fun that it's quite action packed and and I must admit I enjoyed that you know I, I'm not uh, uh, like the people you referred to earlier you know I don't, I don't want to shoot police and rifle the pockets you know I don't want to play Cthulhu as if it's uh, a dungeon crawl because that's not what it is and, and if it was it'd become tedious but I do think there's an element of action in it which is kind of refreshing and quite exciting yeah and possibly puts an interesting spin on the game, really. But if you think of our background, was in those white dwarf adventures, wasn't it? So, yeah. as we said, fairly small scale, yeah, yeah, uh, little uh, things, but still, you know, packed with powerful stories. But this is like the complete opposite, isn't it? This is mm. like yeah. epic in scale, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and as well as as well as the action, there's a little bit, quite a lot, really, of the characters, the player characters finding spells and using some of the Cthulhu magic against Cthulhu. There's a great, um, and again, I don't want to give anything away, but there's a great scene uh, in the, the episode in London where we defeated some Cthulhu cultists by using their own magic against them. Uh, and that that's kind of exciting. And a li- as you say, a little bit different from the way we were used to playing it. Yeah. Um, you know, we used to play it more low key. So yeah, I, I enjoyed all that, those elements of it a lot. I think it's very rich in atmosphere as well. Yeah. And that you mentioned that London episode. Mm. I, I particularly remember that one being particularly, you know, the, the fog taking on a, a life of its own and, uh, it, the, the, the whole little details that it provides, uh, it's fairly broad brush, the kind of cultural settings, but it's kind of done in a way that yeah. actually, Immerses you in it, doesn't it? Yeah, and it does, and it does have the kind of investigative element as well. So there is there is a lot of that. There's a lot of piecing together of clues, which is again satisfying. But there's a nice balance between that a bit of action, atmosphere, and also the kind of uh, Cthulhu horror um, that you would expect from a game of Cthulhu. Uh, so no character feels particularly safe. There's some, there's some good uh, NPCs in there as well. Uh, Edward Gavigan, Omar, Shaptin, Warren Bassett. He's, he's a drug addled um, character in the middle of Egypt. And I'd add a bit too he much is. wine. I, I think it goes with the greatest NPC performance of your career. Yeah. Because, as you say, he was, a, he was an opium addict. He was high as he was talking to us. And you'd had about three quarters of a bottle of wine. Yeah. So it was a very convincing portrayal of someone slightly adult. Yeah, and booze and, booze and role-playing really don't mix, do they? No, they don't. Would you like We've... to join me in a pipe? I think <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's roll it for the last time. Oh, it's Fungan from Yogurt. Uh, a very fitting one, uh, because we're actually reviving this game, uh, and it's actually played it last night so it's fresh in our minds this is a campaign from way back in 1984 and eddie has described it as the poor man's masks of niathletep and he's actually running this for us um but so far you have to say that it was a really exciting episode yeah yeah, the, yeah. the the investigators go on the trail of a psychic uh paul lamond who's disappeared and, uh, and even at this early stage, we're being dragged into some fiendish plots uh, that, that are happening in uh, New York, particularly enhanced by uh, Eddie's hand- handouts last night. The handouts were spectacular. Yes, I think I think if you if you've got a friend who works in a reaper graphics unit, 
get them involved in role playing because they will be able to produce the more spectacular handouts. Yeah, and that again was a again was a, a scrapbook, didn't it? So we were actually sticking them in. As yeah, as we were doing it. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I th- that's an interesting idea actually, because again with Cthulhu, there is that you know it often involves handouts, lots of notes, remembering things from previous um, adventures. I know in Mass of Nathletep, that was always a bit of a problem. You had to remember someone that you'd met several sessions ago yeah, and, and several years ago so, well, in real time <laughs> several years ago but you had to remember things uh, and having this kind of scrapbook to stick things in uh, and having some kind of system of making notes and, and making sure everything's recorded is quite important really more so than any other role-playing game that we play yeah definitely so we'll uh, be interesting to see how that unfolds really enjoying the the first session now so uh, that's the end of uh this uh, exercise in behind the screen uh, I'll pack it away of course uh, Blythe you don't know whether I've got a table here at all you don't know whether I've even got a screen that's very true <laughs> all I need to hear is the, the, the rattle of the dice and my blood runs cold my sanity loses 1d6 points and on that note see you next time goodbye a bargain shed ok so once again I've left the Dirk Towers, gone from under the stairs, and I've come down to the bottom of the garden to Ed Shed. Um, I'll just see if he's available. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello there, Ed. Hello there, Dirk. Okay, so we'll come to your bargain shed because you're kind of like the uh, Ed Dat, the price index for us grognards to understand how we can recreate that grognard experience. Um, mm-hmm. with our own pocket money. So, first of all, I know that you've been working hard on recovering your uh, Cthulhu back catalogue. What happened to the originals? They all sadly went over the wall at a local tip, the <laughs> Rakes Lane Industrial Estate, much to my annoyance now. But at the time, I felt quite good with myself. It was like a cleansing <laughs> as I went into my future life with my wife and mm. what have you. A bad decision on my part. <laughs> So you've been, you've been recovering, recovering, re, rebuying them all. Where, where's the best place to start? Well, it's most obvious, really. It's eBay. eBay offers the most chance to get the bargains. Uh, if you're after, there's two ways of looking at it, really. If you're after, what just buying what you want? Yeah. Go with you know, go with eBay and be prepared to spend. But if you're yeah. after buying something cheap, stick yeah. with eBay and just look out for bargains when they come up. I tend to prefer the first. Go yeah. for what you want. Yeah. and be prepared to pay a little bit extra rather than just going, oh, that's cheap, I'll have that, click, and yeah. then it sits on a, in a cupboard shelf. And do you prefer the uh, hard copies to PDFs? Uh, most definitely, yeah. I, I own most of the things I've got on PDF. I can't read PDFs, that's just me. I prefer the hard copies. Plus, I like the old I like the old style Chaosium product. I like reading them, I like the style, I like the paper. It's uh, I like the smell. It's, it, it gives something that yeah. a PDF doesn't. Yeah, for me anyway. Yeah. So let's um, smell some of these then. Okay, <laughs> I've picked five of uh, the best Cthulhu uh, adventures. So let's start with probably the best, which is Massive Neathletep. So right. how, how do you get hold of that, and how much do you expect to pay? Well, there's, it depends which edition you want. Uh, you can, if you're after the the latest edition, which I think is the fourth. I would probably just go on Amazon and pick that up for around fifteen pounds. You can go on that as that is the complete edition. But why people go on on uh, on eBay and then bid up to I don't know twenty to thirty for the complete mass and knife attack, which I think is the third edition. Why someone would want that because it's not even the first. I could understand why somebody would pay more for the first edition. Yeah, I I think I would. For the first edition, but uh, yeah. I would stick to Amazon to get the. To I, get the I remember, the I remember edition. you getting the uh, first edition. That's and right. Was, uh, uh, looking through that, and the thing that we loved the most about it was the handouts, wasn't it? Uh, that you yeah, got it was there. really original, wasn't it? Yeah. It. Uh, I don't think it was the first 
uh, called the Cthulhu campaign, but it was the one that was vast in my eyes. There was a lot of handouts. It was yeah. even the matchbox. It was just it was something completely different. Uh, and was that one that went over the wall? I don't know. I, I think it was. I've, I wouldn't have thrown that away. I think I lent it to somebody. Yeah, but in our Linda B, we've all been right. burnt by that. Haven't we? Yeah, yeah. So to get the original box set, how much could you expect to pay? Well, I, I've I've not seen that that often. Although it has come up this week, and I'm and I'm keeping my eye on it. Right. So maybe there's an update for that. You can pop onto the end of your podcast because I haven't seen the first edition yet. I know there's one on Amazon in the US. Yeah. Around about eighty five dollars. Right. Uh, I'm not prepared to pay that. No. But if I could see it, it goes for something like twenty quid. Yeah. I might pick it up. But that's the first edition. Yeah. Uh, see how it goes. How about something closer to home? The next uh, one is uh, Green and Pleasant Land, a Games Workshop supplement. That's up quite frequently on eBay. I would say something around about fifteen to twenty. Yeah. Uh, I know some people might roll their eyes who's picked it up for around about five to ten quid. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you can. Again, it seems to come up around £30 on Amazon for some yeah. reason. I don't know why I won't pay that much. Yeah. I'll probably pay around £15 on eBay okay. for the Green and Pleasant Land. It's one I haven't got, actually. Oh, have I? Uh, so, I have the PDF of it, but I've not got it. So that's, that's one for the Christmas list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Fungi from Yuga, oh, yeah. one of our favourites. Yeah, that was the very first campaign I ran back in 1987 or 88. Fond memories of that. Again, I think you could... There's two versions of that. There's the, the Day of the Beast and the Fungi, which is basically the Fungi from Yugoth with extra scenarios. Or oh, the Fungi from Yugoth, which is the first edition. It's not been re-released or anything. I reckon you could pick that up on eBay from around about 10 to £15 pounds, uh, for, for the first edition, which is one I would probably go for, rather than paying... It's around about, I paid £30, I think, for Day of the Beast because it had the extra scenarios. It's not worth that extra. Plus the cover art is not as good on the second, the Day of the Beast edition. Right, and is the Cthulhu case book, is that from Guy from Yuga? Oh, sorry, yeah, it does. There is another edition, yeah. Yeah. That, uh, it contained the complete first edition of Fungi from Yugoth. Yeah. Plus some other scenarios, which I can't recall, Three editions then, hasn't it? Yeah. So which ones have you got? I've just got the first yeah. fungi from Yogoth and the Day of the Beast. Right. With the view to running the the, the fungi from Yogoth, I would I have looked at the Day of the Beast and the extra scenarios are just not worth it. No. Save your money. Yeah. Okay. I'll take that advice. <laughs> um, and uh, Cthulhu 1990s. <laughs> Is that the same as Cthulhu? No. Yeah. I think it's I think so. Two editions, so. but I'm not quite sure of the differences. I don't have either. Is strictly uh, Cthulhu then rather than Cthulhu now. Well, it, Cthulhu now is Cthulhu eighties, <laughs> <laughs> so it's Cthulhu neither here nor there. <laughs> uh, well, I've seen that on Amazon for two pound fifty, and I still didn't buy it. Uh, yeah, right. it's, it's on eBay frequently for ten pound. Buy it now, possibly for fifteen pounds. Why would anybody would want that? Because with the fifth and sixth edition rules. You have all of that. You have all the Cthulhu now information. Yeah. Uh, so there's no need to buy it. So it doesn't, it doesn't get a vote of confidence from you then? No, that'll no. be down on the list. Yeah, okay. And uh, the last thing I've picked on there are uh, White Dwarf scenarios. Again, it, I think it very, if you were into Call of Cthulhu, which I think started to appear in White Dwarf from about edition 60, yeah. I'd be wrong there, 60-ish, yeah. 50, 60-ish, they tend to be a little bit cheaper. I'm sure there's some rarer, I, I'm not into collecting White Dwarf, but I'm sure there's some rarer editions of it and some cheaper editions that may be quite common. But uh, White Dwarfs around the Call of Cthulhu era, I would say about £5, possibly pay £3 plus a bit of, postage on top yeah and you can occasionally get some uh, job lot bundles can't you yeah i yeah. picked up about six or seven yeah for about uh, i think it was 10 15 pounds or something like that okay so it boils down to about two pound the more you collect the less you can get the bundle because it'll overlap yeah so anyway so before we leave your shed on this occasion of all the things that you've collected and stuff that we haven't covered here what is the best that you've picked up uh, it's hard to say I mean I do love me Escape from Innsmouth I mean it was one of my favourite stories in uh, from Lovecraft I'm not a big Lovecraft reader really I think yeah. Sandy Peterson did more for uh, Lovecraft than Lovecraft did but uh, I love the vibe of Escape from Innsmouth dingy town it was just one I had to get when I bought it it cost me about £30 from eBay 
And I did see two going on Amazon for eighteen pounds, not shortly, not long ago. Yeah. I know I should have bought them just to sell on because they're now back up to one hundred and eighteen pounds. I think. Good grief! I don't know why it's so much, but it's. Uh, yeah. I like the look of it. I love the art. The deep yeah. ones. They're slowly changing visages from the human to a deep one. It's just just great. Yeah. And the adventures are good as well. That's good. I look forward to playing that sometime then. Maybe. In about 10 years' time. <laughs> <laughs> That's our rate of play, isn't it, at the moment? <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Ed. Until next time. My pleasure. Thank you. Horse bag. There's hardly room to move in this den under the stairs, thanks to the stamped addressed envelopes and postcards that have been descending upon Dirk Towers. Here's a choice selection of some of the correspondence that I've gratefully received from listeners over the past couple of weeks. It's very encouraging to get feedback and five-star reviews on iTunes, like this one from BonamyGames.uk. A rich trip down memory lane to Gringle's Pawn Shop. A fine reminiscence on the joys of first discovering RuneQuest 2 back in the 1980s, drawn into a modern context with an appreciation of the developments of 21st century RPGs. The style tends towards monologue, which, in a podcast of this length, some might find a teensy bit wearing, but Dirk's Boltonian tones and gentle and clean humour made the whole affair quite soothing for me personally. The podcast shows a clear and deep understanding of RuneQuest 2 and a critical appreciation of the game. And it's at its best during the light-hearted dialogue with Dirk's rules lawyer. More please. Thanks for that. Soothing, eh? Uh, Good to know that the podcast can double as a relaxation tape. As for Judge Blythe... Well, he'll be prominent in the next couple of episodes, so all I can say is be careful what you wish for. I asked listeners to contact me with their Call of Cthulhu experiences, and I received this in my email box, dirkthedice at gmail.com, from Mike Williams. Living in North Wales, the nearest game shop was 45 minutes car journey over the border in Chester. I never saw a copy of Dagon, but I still remember the day I found a copy of The Unspeakable Oath. This magazine taught me how to play and write for Cthulhu, and Pagan Publishing was essentially founded off the back of it. T.U.O. is still going today, 20 odd years on, and it's only up to issue 25. But the first nine issues before it changed format are are up there with White Dwarf, in my opinion. Look on eBay now, and you'll see some issues going for £60 to £80. Pounds. And I've seen even higher than that go, too. But there are two adventures that they publish that stand out, both of which are standalone, one-of-a-kind scenarios. The first is in Medea Res. It's a modern day, but it needn't be, and a LARP. Imagine your players turning up for this one one night game you've been planning. So, uh, pre-generated characters then, uh, what are my skills? Oh, you won't be needing any paperwork. Now, just uh, slip into this orange boiler suit. It was written by Pagan founder Jonathan Tynes, and although it's simple to stage, it's just so easy to generate a true sense of fear with. There are lots of testimonials and write-ups posted online and they're great to read. And there's such a love for this adventure that out there. It was the adventure that got us into creating our own Call of Cthulhu LARP scenarios in the days before Cthulhu Live. Secondly, a grace under pressure. It was a complete scenario based on the confines of a futuristic underwater deep research vessel. As the entire adventure was confined to the ship, it came with a map for the use of with miniatures. But people also lapped it. But we did a sort of mix of tabletop and live action. I spent ages preparing a sub 
looking room and had a whale song and sonar pings playing on a loop. Very strong memories for me, as it's one of the last things we did as a group before splitting up to go to college and temporarily falling out of RPGs for 15 years. TUO has changed a lot. The Cthulhu offshoot Delta Green started within its pages, and it now devotes a fair amount of space to it. But it's still worth a read. Keep up with the podcast. Not a medium I usually enjoy, but you've got me hooked. Looking forward to Traveller too. Thanks for that, Mike. I've never heard of The Unspeakable Oath, or I've never larped Cthulhu, but it sounds intriguing. Are there any other listeners out there with similar experiences? And please let me know. Over at the armchairadventurerblog.com, this fascinating comment was added by Big Jack Brass, John Hancock. Another thoroughly enjoyable episode. It's impossible to cover everything, of course, but interesting tidbit confirmed by Sandy Peterson in interviews is that the sanity mechanic has its origin in Tunnels and Trolls. G. Arthur and Philip J. Rahman wrote an article for the summer 1980 issue of Sorcerer's Apprentice, Flying Buffalo's gaming and fiction magazine, called The Lovecraft Variant, which adapted the TNT rules to the novel setting of Lovecraft stories. Was it the first Lovecraftian RPG, other than adding Mathos creatures to fantasy games? I'm afraid I don't know, but it's the earliest I've found. John also kindly provided a copy of the article, and it is indeed fascinating to consider it as a seed in the origin of Call of Cthulhu. Tunnels and Trolls rules were always simple and driven by a sense of fun. There'll be a file on that coming soon. But this variant on the rules has many, many, many elements that sound familiar. For example, there's an additional character attribute called emotional stability, which quantifies the character's ability to withstand extreme horror without facing mental trauma. If the character faces an horrific encounter, they'll need to make a saving throw to avoid a fear reaction. This may include an onset of paranoia or a fainting fit, depending on the role of the table. There's even a saving check for a character understanding the greater significance of a a horrific discovery. In place of experience points, there are knowledge points because the characters are investigators who probe mysteries. There's some detail on the Lovecraft paraphernalia, such as ancient tomes and mythos-related background of ancient gods. But for me, it's this statement that is the prelude to Call of Cthulhu. Players who adopt to be characters in a horror story must recognise that the games master is only doing his duty if he gives them a very rough time. In this genre, death and madness fall with horrifying frequency. Inspiring stuff indeed. I'll pop the article on armchairadventurerblog.com site to allow further discussion. But for now, That's everything from the postbag this time and the end of the Call of Cthulhu micro grog pod. Please, please keep in touch by following me on Twitter at the grognard file or dirt the dice at gmail.com where you can send me an email or even better, take time to give iTunes a review to confound those corporate robots. Next time, I'll be reaching for the grognard file labelled Traveller, science fiction adventure in the far future. Until then, thanks for listening. Adios, amigos. Stormtrooper on a G-back. It's July 2023. Eight years ago since I first published this episode of the grognard files, so it seems appropriate that I become nostalgic for the nostalgia. As I've said before, pop will indeed eat itself. 
This version has been levelled and had some light editing to make things a bit more fluent. And people like the chapter markers too, so I've added them so you can skip to the bits that you want to listen to. At the time of recording this, I'm putting together episode 63 of the 111 podcasts that we've produced. No, I don't know how the numbering works either. It's all about Liminal, the modern investigation game which is set between the ordinary and the extraordinary. Listening to our discussion here about the supplement Green and Pleasant Land for Call of Cthulhu, many aspects that appeal about Liminal are apparent. There's something inspirational for your gaming if you keep things close to home and examine how your locality intersects with the strange, magical and horrific. It's worth noting that at the time we were recording this episode, the second episode, the three of us had got together since 2010 and had been playing about 10 sessions a year, perhaps less than that. While here in 2023, I've already done more than 50 sessions and it's only July. When we were reviewing this material from the 1980s, it was with a sense of wonder and potential. We were keen to seek out the supplements and the games that we couldn't afford when we were younger and rediscover them or see them for the first time. Now, with all the experience of playing over the years, me and Blythe are probably a bit more hard-nosed about it all. That's apart from Eddie. He's still finding magic in the nostalgia. Following a hiatus due to the global pandemic and the lack of a kitchen table, we're now back playing face-to-face with Eddie once a month. We don't have the same time to record the podcast with him, but we're playing games that recall the spirit that first captivated us when we first met in the 1980s and the spirit that we rediscovered in 2010. And every so often, he'll surprise us with the latest discovery that he's sourced from the internet. I suppose that's changed too. As they say on Escape to the Country, the prices are right at the time of recording. If you're an RPG bargain hunter, things are a bit different now in 2023. Some of the long-standing companies have unleashed their backlist to the print-on-demand market on drive-thru RPG. Some of those hard-to-reach items are now freely available to purchase at a reasonable price. That doesn't seem to have affected the secondary collector's market, where second-hand copies of all this stuff is now going for ridiculous prices. I don't think Eddie's Wait and see strategy works anymore. Perhaps this podcast has had an inflationary effect on prices on some of these things in the UK too. If it has, then I apologise. It was an unintended consequence. As I say pretty frequently, I'm not a collector. I try and get hold of this older stuff because I enjoy the pleasure of old physical things. But I also like using them. I'm not precious. If necessary, I'll use the drive through versions. It's the content that I'm after. For further evidence of the growth of the nostalgia market, John Hancock, Big Jack Brass, more from him in future episodes, mentioned the Lovecraft variant in an article in Sorcerer's Apprentice magazine which contained the rules for introducing Lovecraft to your Tunnels and Trolls game. He made the point that it predated Call of Cthulhu and Sandy Peterson has acknowledged that it was an inspiration. But the Lovecraft variant has now become a full-blown game by the same authors and available from drive Through RPG. And I have it on good authority that it's a workable and useful game framework for Cthulhu Adventures. There you go, another one remastered. Let me know what you think of them. Perhaps I could add another postbag to the postbag in these extra segments as I remaster them, revisiting them every eight years to a point where they come so big that it destroys the internet. 
It's like a shoggoth in your stream. Right, it's Back to the Future and Liminal. See you there. Adios, amigos. <laughs>